Okay. Lord, as we look into your words, would you speak to us that we might be your living body going out into the world to give the gospel to the world? For your name's sake, Lord Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Doug last week said that we're either fans of Jesus or disciples of Jesus. Fans are not disciples. Fans. Well, we're not fans. And who would want to be something like the Chelsea manager? Or should I say the long line of managers who walk through the door, but with in a season, they're out. If that's how fans treat their managers, who'd want to be a Premier League manager? And one of our numbers said to Doug and I earlier this year, well, who'd want to be a church leader? Here we are. Now, at the beginning of the summer holidays, Simon helped us think through the first section on leaders in the church in 1 Timothy chapter 3, examining the person specification given in the text and helping us to think about how we might help our leaders to have those qualities and therefore more fully live out their vocation. And Simon highlighted a key verse for us, which was Paul's understanding of the church. It occurs back in 1 Timothy 3, and it's verses 13 to 15. And it says this, the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. And he goes on to say, he, that's Jesus, appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. He's stating that the church holds the gospel right there in those verses. And Paul proceeds to unpack that and say, well, what does that look like in leadership? What does it look like in many different areas? Above all, let's see what the gospel looks like on display in the church. So as I said last week, Doug helps us to consider how we care for one another. And this week, our text, of course, focuses still on the household of God, caring for elders, those are the leaders, not those older in the church, see, so that's a uh, clarification that you gave me earlier, and also caring for the church. Let there be a difference, is what Paul is saying, in the way that the leaders care for the body, and the way that the body cares for its elders, its leaders. And why? Because God intends the church for people to look into the church and to see the glory of God expressed in the gospel of God. As the gospel permeates everything that we are, everything that we do. I want to draw out two ways that we, the congregation, and I consider myself the congregation as well as a leader in the church, the congregation are invited to care for our leaders. And two ways the leaders are to be accountable to the body of Christ. And then think how we might carry that out. Notice first in that first verse, we demonstrate the power of the gospel, the glory of God in the way that we honor elders with generous provision. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, it says, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. First of all, I think double honour involves respect. We see that in the immediate context straight after our passage in the first verse of the next chapter, when it says, let all who are under a yoke of slave slavery should consider their martyr as worthy of full respect. Paul is perhaps indicating here there's a sense of gratitude involved in this idea of honour. The same thing later on in that chapter in verse 16. This time Paul is referencing to God, saying who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Again, that idea of appreciation, of gratitude, of respect towards God. And elsewhere, Paul highlights um, for us in 
the book of Thessalonians or the letter to the Thessalonian church. We ask you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who work hard among you and who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love because of their work. Now, the idea of double honour may include the idea of pay also. And we see that in verse 18. It says, the scriptures say, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the labourer deserves his wages. If a labourer is labouring, and he quotes here from Jesus, he's saying the labourer deserves their wages. And he also brings in that curious verse from Deuteronomy about the ox. You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. God's instructions to his people right from the earliest times was then to allow the animal to eat as it was laboring, to graze as it were. So too the preacher and teacher labors, let them have recompense. Some ministers choose to be self-supporting, while others receive a stipend so that they can give themselves fully to this work. We as congregation demonstrate our support to our diocese, then by our financial giving, so that the gospel can be proclaimed in every parish across our diocese. Paul, though, lays down conditions for this worthiness of honour. He says they must direct the affairs of the church well. It's a good managing of the household here so that there isn't chaos and a care above all for the people of God, so that they are shepherded and loved by their leaders. And secondly, not only that they direct the affairs of the church well, but that they would labour diligently in the word, as several translations put it. My prayer is that God gives us grace to continue to honour the word of God in such a way that we then honour those who give themselves to it. Next, we're asked to protect our leaders from unfounded accusations. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that our leaders are accused. They are more frequently the targets of accusation than other people in the congregation. I know this myself when I first became a Christian. The godly leader that I was serving under came under such tremendous attack, it was heartbreaking to see and yet it was unfounded. The reformer Calvin <coughs> said, none are more exposed to slanders and insults than godly teachers. They may perform their duties correctly and conscientiously, yet they never avoid a thousand criticisms. So what should we, the congregation, do? We must never ignore serious allegations nor dismiss them out of hand, yet we are to be cautious when elders, when leaders are accused. Because as I say, accusations are going to come. When we go into leadership of the church, we are trained that that is exactly what we will encounter. But let us who serve under them take the utmost care and consideration when they are accused. I think Paul, by the very nature of the public calling, of a leader in the church says, well, how can we honor them? The passage, I think, encourages, encourages us to be eager to eliminate those unfounded uh, accusations or unhelpful criticisms that simply bring down the reputation of those who are laboring in the ministry of the word. And I think more importantly, going back to that verse in chapter three, because the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. And we don't want the glory of God nor the gospel to be hindered or diminished in any way. But finally, Paul tells Timothy to rebuke unrepentant leaders when there is credible evidence in the, and to do it in the presence of all. Perhaps so that the rest may stand in fear or not perhaps, the rest may stand in fear. And I take that rest to mean the rest of the congregation and not just the rest of the leaders. No doubt in the context of this letter, there were 
false teachers who were disrupting the church. And Paul is in, implicitly calling for their public review. But no doubt Timothy had a relationship with some of them. And Paul is saying, I don't care how painful it is. I'm charging you in, pre in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and of the elect, he says. I charge you to keep these rules without prejudicing, doing nothing from favoritism. The integrity of both their private and their public life is to be above reproach for the sake of the gospel. And that includes mine. So we honor, we protect, we rebuke. And then last, we are to point each leader with great care. Because careful selection is for the benefit of those choosing, but also for the protection of his church. We're not always going to make the right decisions. Sometimes we're going to deny leaders we shouldn't deny. And sometimes we're going to allow leaders perhaps we shouldn't. That is just the nature of it. But let's make every effort to follow the word, to appoint godly leaders, and in so doing, protect the church. I have to draw an aside to something that Steve and I were uh, talking about before this service. We see the humanity of Paul. He's writing a letter. I like this because when I'm writing a letter, I just have a, oh, and by the way, and there's that verse about, by the way, Timothy, have a little wine um, along with your water. Now, context of that, well, we can surmise what the context of that might be. But I think the gist for all of us is that we're to look after our physical bodies. And uh, Paul just insert that in there. We may feel, having heard this so far, somewhat indifferent to these household patterns Paul is setting out for us. Maybe these matters seem somewhat trivial in our eyes. But we have to realize these are not trivial in God's eyes. In Acts chapter 20, we read Jesus has bought the church with his own blood. The church of God is precious to God, not just in and of itself, but as I said, because God intends to display the glory of himself in the church. He neither wants us to run it as a fan club nor as a business model. Instead, he's given us these words, this model for his household in the way that we are to relate between congregation and leader and vice versa. So let's not casually ignore God's words. These are commandments, not suggestions. And he says to us to honor, to protect, to rebuke, to appoint. God's intention is for pastors who would lay their lives down for the, the flock, who would live among them, and who would love them with the love of Christ. And then in response, the congregation, the sheep, who would then love their shepherd, follow the under-shepherds, who would give generously to their shepherd, to their church, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, but because they love them, and they love the word of God. Because this is the ground in which the gospel best flourishes. We all need the gospel. The end goal of this passage is not to have well-honored leaders or public rebukes. The end goal is the glory of God and for the gospel to go forward in us and through us, who are the household of God. Mm -hmm.